Yeah. I love my HBCU. And boy, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man, I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man, I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the ACCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. Hey dog, I'll be right back. All right, this is Dr. Bills inside the HBC Sports Lab with A.D. Drew. Joshua Sims, B.J. Jones will be back in the shot. We'll catch up with a little bit of those truly, Charles Bishop in the second half of the show, and Mike Washington is out on assignment. He literally was boarding a plane. Um, he was trying to see if he could make it, but not quite to be. Uh, as he wanted to get down with the get down, as he said. Shout out to TSU. I was at the game, man. When's the last time you seen Texas Southern University beat Southern Grambling in all corn in the same year? Yeah, I know you'll say 2010 when they won the championship on the field, but obviously those victories were taken away uh, from them when you talk about that. But I thought that was a shout out there. With that being said, let's go to the champions. We crowned some champions yesterday. Starting with the CIAA. Rise Maze, no more. Fayetteville State Broncos get it done. But it was in thrilling fashion. 31 to 28 on a field goal with zero time remaining on the clock when it was all said and done. Celebration goes to spoils. You see the pitches here. Of the championship, man, big time shout out to uh, Fayetteville State Broncos, the 2022 CIAA championship. With this victory, they should get in the playoffs. Let's go over to the SIAC team that's been holding it down in terms of the number one rankings. Benedict Tigers, they left no doubt in regards to how they came in that game, and they Really jumped on the Golden Tigers from the beginning and just continued to push as they win 58 to tw uh, 21. You see the championship water. It was cold out there, man. I don't know about doing it. You're cold, man. You go run some extra laps, but I guess he's so excited. He let him have it. You see the championship shirts there. Unfortunately, this was the game that no one saw uh, because <laughs> of the issues of the production company. I do want to clear it out because a lot of people are putting this on ESPN. In the backstory, there may be some direct links to ESPN uh, with encoders and production, stuff like that, uh, in framework with that. But I do want to make it clear that ESPN does not do production on these games, and really none of their games. They hire out, uh, even for the games they do directly on ABC, ESPN. And now, oftentimes, those are union guys uh, that they put out there. But for the ESPN three and ESPN plus games that are done by a lot of the conferences. That's the conference that makes the call in terms of the production. At that point, they just become a digital platform. No more than what you have with YouTube, uh, my JBN, if you would, when we download it, uh, obviously uh, in terms of some of those platforms, HBC League Pack, Ads Plus, uh, HBCU Go, they're just platforms out there. So I did want to put that out there. Now let's go to the big dogs over there at the MEAC. Somebody got it done uh, in terms of at least a share of the championship. It's not quite done yet. But more importantly is the fact that they earned the bid to Atlanta for the Celebration Bowl to represent the MEAC. That's the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, for those that may not know. Not to our viewers, everybody knows here pretty much. For the most part, shout out to them. And they did it in fine fashion as they dominated in that contest. Norfolk jumped out early, but North Carolina Central reels them down, gets it done, and wins 48-14. to 14. Um, And Jackson State won uh, the East Division 
uh, as they will host the championship game. They got a little more to do uh, because they'll have a fourth coming from the West, which hasn't been decided yet in terms of the SWAC. So that's fascinating, too. So it's been delighted to see out there. We'll get into a little bit of the mix uh, for the West division of the SWAC to see what's next. But with that being said, let me go to Joshua Sim Sr. because he is representing, as he should be, as, again, the Eagles get it done. What are your thoughts in terms of some of the games yesterday? Anything stood out to you? I yeah, man. I mean, obviously, the first thing that stands out is Fayetteville State finally becoming the bride, no longer the bridesmaid, um, and, and doing it in such a uh, almost theatrical fashion, man. It reminds me of in the early 2000s, North Carolina Central was playing in the CIAA Championship. We were hosting the CIAA Championship in, in Durham, and, and we won with a walk-off kick. Uh, and so, literally, man, Fayetteville State winning 43-yard walk-off kick, you know, just to end the game. I mean, it was such an amazing way. And in very much Fayetteville State fashion, you know, they were not going to be able to go out and just dominate a CIAA championship game for them to get their first one, you know, in, in a long time. So, you know, I, I imagine that it would have had to be very theatrical and very much how we ended yesterday. Uh, but also, man, just a huge shout out to Benedict, man, uh, to Coach Chinsbury, man, and, and that bit, and that Benedict staff and those players, man. What a way, man. For those, uh, just a data point I put out there yesterday. Coach Chinsbury was hired on the job in 2020, uh, did not get a chance to play in the 2020 because that was the COVID season. Then the 21 season, he goes out and they go five and five, 500. And after that season, this man has not lost a game at Benedict. Straight through, 11 and 0 now, has won this SIAC. And I believe they have a great chance to be able to do what they're going to do in the Division II playoffs. And then last but absolutely certain, not least, uh, 1801 Fayetteville Street stand up, baby. Uh, we've restored order in the MEAC. We back, baby. You know what I mean? We are the <laughs> champions again, and we come into the A-Town, and we ain't going to have nothing to say until then. We still got a game next week. We ain't got nothing to say. All you Jackson State fans, y'all, everybody, whoever it is, we don't even know who's going yet. So whoever it is, we ain't going to talk. We ain't saying nothing at all. We'll see y'all in Atlanta. Y'all will hear us when we inside the stadium. 30,000, 40,000 plus North Carolina Central fans. The tickets flying off the way. Y'all going to see. <laughs> y'all going to see. what. The, hear me what I'm saying to you now. Y'all going to see what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, boy. I like this. This is going to get real interesting. Eddie hey, Drew, what were your thoughts on what happened yesterday? Season of first. And yeah, we're going to talk about so we're gonna talk about the SIAC. For the first time since... <clears throat> Since Winston-Salem in 2012, we had a Division II HBCU go through the regular season undefeated. You have to go all the way back to 2007 when Tuskegee did it for an SIAC team that has gone through the regular season undefeated. Also, AC, uh, so first for Benedict, uh, first time since Winston-Salem during that same era, that an SIAC will be the number one seed in the region. And I said projected, but it's, there's no doubt which, uh, Benedict will be the number one seed. Mm -hmm. we go, we go, we're going to do some other first. First time since 2010, Tuskegee and Benedict have played. First time ever, let me repeat that, ever that Benedict has defeated Tuskegee on the gridiron. Wow. And the last first. This is also the first time that Tuskegee in a championship game scenario. That's going back Pioneer Bowl, SIAC championship. Uh those scenarios, not talking playoffs, we're talking about it versus another HBCU, has lost a championship game in their storied history. Wow. wow, great breakdown, great analysis about AD Drew. Wow. Um, I will say, like we said, Charles Bishop's comment in terms of his thoughts, uh, since everybody's breaking down these champions, we'll, we'll get him in the second half and make sure he gets a chance to talk about that a little bit. Uh, so with that time, I do want to talk about uh, Shredor Sanya Sanders uh, as he went out in the game uh, on a um, hit where he – Decided to take the ball down a little bit. 
And as he's done more times this year, and he kind of got crunched between two tacklers, my understanding that uh, he had a concussion, more precautionary, uh, was pretty clear and uh, maybe could have came back in the game. But, you know, these days people tend to take more caution than ever on the concussion. Uh, so the good news out there in terms of his health and his framework that he's looking good. But I did want to share for those that uh, had saw that or heard about it and wanted to know more. So uh, we'll flush that out, I'm sure, through in the media uh, questions tomorrow uh, and throughout the week, if not updates and not giving uh, a little sooner. So I did want to put that on the table. With that being said, let me go to BJ Jones to get his thoughts in terms of what took place yesterday, either with the championships or, uh, or any match that he saw, what, what he thought that kind of stood out to him as he jumps back in here in the mix. Oh, man, biggest thing, man, the championships on yesterday, uh, the dominance of Benedict and the way mm. that they started and the way that that football team has finished, You've seen them get better and better as each week progresses. Uh, defensively, they're very stout. That The way they move the ball offensively on the ground as well as in the air, man, they are impressive. And I'm interested to see what Benedict can, can do in the Division II playoffs. And then yesterday in Montgomery, I was there, Alabama State FAMU, the renewal of that rivalry. Uh, the first time that FAMU had been to Montgomery from a, from a football standpoint uh, in 43 years. Wow. wow, which has been a long time. And I tell you what, man, you can feel the, electric, the electricity in the air. And just talking to Alabama State and family, you people on yesterday, uh, and with my dad now, uh, man, I was blown away just how deep this rivalry goes uh, between Alabama State and, and, and FAMU. And I think that this is one of the budding rivalries in the swag, and I think over the next few years, it's going to be one of the bigger rivalries in the conference. Oh, I'm glad you shared that historical perspective and got in there, particularly as we move forward. Yeah, if you keep getting games like this, no doubt, especially with teams being, you know, at the top of the East, um, and, and what does that mean for the Eastern Division? Uh, it's going to be fascinating moving forward between these two teams and what it means with the standings. Uh, and all of that good stuff. Speaking about that, let's get in a little bit. I want to show um, last week's rankings and give you some updates and break down as we kind of get out of this side of it, of what's next, what's uh, on the horizon in terms of those divisions. So you see what took place yesterday. With the win by Jackson State, they go to 7-0, 10-0 overall. This is last week's standards before game yesterday. Um, and so now they – automatically, as we said, are crowned the Eastern Division. So they're sitting on top of the perch, waiting to see who they play for a championship game. They do have the rivalry game against Alcorn, which could come into the fold for Alcorn as we will get a little more into the West. Uh, but FAMU approves to 6-1, and 8-2 and two overall as they solidify that second spot in the East Division. Um, and they have a game left with their rival, obviously, which may determine if they put themselves right in position, at least to be in the dialogue, if not getting a FCS uh, at large bid to the playoffs. Depends on what they do. Also depends on what the field is doing. And that starts to clear up a little bit this week as well. Alabama State um, finished solid. They have Turkey Day classes. They proved to, I mean, they dropped to four and three, uh, six and four. Obviously, a and falls to three and four. Three and seven. Their loss to Texas lost yesterday to Jackson State. But Thorne Cookman, tough loss to Alcorn. They fall to two and five, two and eight. And the Mississippi Valley also fall, falls to Southern as they move to one and six and one and nine. It really gets interesting in the East, which has not finished. There are literally four teams that are in the mix for the championship uh, in terms of what that looks like. For every one yesterday, so they got one step closer. They improved to five and two, six and four. It becomes simple in this manner, or if you want to call it simple. They win, it's done. They lock up the West. They play Valley next week on the road, and it's always interesting in Valley. For every played and beat up on Pine Bluff yesterday, uh, we'll get into that scoring mix a little later in the show, but uh, big win on the road for them. Southern. Improved to four and three, six and four. So 
two-way tiebreaker. That's just simple head-to-head, the first thing. Two-way tiebreaker between Southern and Prairie View. If everybody else loses, uh, then it becomes pretty simple. Southern is in. Southern's in because they're head-to-head win over Prairie View. If it's a two-way tie just between Prairie View and Southern. Southern goes to the championship uh, to face Jackson State uh, a second time this season, obviously. If it's a tie break between Texas Southern and Prairie View, with, let's say, everybody else loses except for Texas Southern wins next week again on the road against Alabama a and Prairie View loses uh, and the rest of the team loses, then the tiebreaker goes to Prairie View because of their Labor Day win going all the way back to the first game of the season. Think about that. Because their head-to-head win over Texas Southern at home, Prairie View goes. Two-way tie between Alcorn State and Prairie View. Alcorn came down there on that Friday night, got it done in overtime. Guess what? Alcorn would go to the championship. But this means that they would have to defeat Jackson State next week, and then they'd have to have everybody else lose in terms of that matchup. That's the simple thing, as I said, two-way tiebreakers. Well, of course, it can get just a little more interesting. You could have three-team tiebreakers. Prairie View Southern and Texas Southern. Uh, Let's say Prairie View loses, Southern wins, Texas Southern wins, and Alcorn loses. Then you have the two-way. Well, the head-to-head tiebreaker wouldn't do it. All of them beat each other. So Texas Southern, Southern, and Prairie View would be one and one in terms of the head-to-head tiebreaks because they beat each other. And you go into what they call the second tiebreaker, which is your Western Division framework. What was your record against just your divisional opponents? Well, Texas Southern would be 4-1. and one. Yeah, let me say that again because y'all missed that. Texas Southern would be 4-1. and one. Prairie View would be 3-2. and two. Southern, which means they would have to win out all the way to the Bayou Classic, which means they would be 3-2. and two. Guess who goes? 4-1, Texas Southern. <laughs> Three-team tiebreaker, Alcorn, Prairie View, and Texas Southern. Those three teams in the mix, meaning Southern loses to Grambling in the Bayou Classic. Alabama State wins out, Prairie View loses, and Texas Southern wins. Head-to-head, all of them beat each other. So they're all one-to-one. Goes to the Western Division. Again, TSU 4-1. Prairie View's 3-2. and two. Alcorn State is two and three. Did the worst in terms of divisional matchups. Texas Southern gold. So Texas Southern so far is rooting for a three-way tiebreak versus uh, obviously a two tiebreak that does not fall in their favor. Prairie View. It could be a three-team tiebreak that goes down to Alcorn, Prairie View, or Southern. This is where B.J. Jones is uh, getting a little bright eye because in that matchup head-to-head, First tiebreaker, Southern is 2-0 against those teams. Auburn State is 1-1. Prairie View sure does not want this to happen because they're 0-2. They would not have a thought. It doesn't even go to the Western Division, which would have Prairie View 3-2, Southern 3-2, and and Alcorn 2-3 just for disparity. Southern moves ahead and gets it done in that three-way tiebreak scenario. We're not finished, folks. <clears throat> Last one, there could be a 14 tiebreaker with AD Drew kind of alluded to. <laughs> well, I'll check the Miak in you. Yeah, you love Miakis. And now we have the Swackies <laughs> for the Western Division. <laughs> That's a 14 tiebreak, which means Auburn State won, Prairie View lost, Southern wins a couple of weeks from now in the Bayou, and you're waiting all out. And Texas Southern wins next week against Alabama AM. Head to head tiebreaker, Texas Southern is 2 and 1. Southern is two and one. Auburn State is one and two, and Prairie View is one and two. Comes down to TSU Southern. TSU has the head-to-head tiebreaker over <clears throat> Southern, and so in that case, Texas Southern goes. So Texas Southern wants a three-team or four-team tiebreak, and they would find themselves in the championship game. Who would have thought that? 
uh, four and one Prairie View. So the only thing that helps Alcorn is a two way tiebreaker because they had to win. That's their only seat in there. And again, in the Western Division with four teams, if it went to this tiebreaker, it would be TSU four and one Prairie View three and two, Southern three and two, Alcorn State two and three. With that being said, as folks talk about, Dooley is undefeated at home. So some intriguing things in terms of what he's able to do. Uh, but that Bayou class is looming out there, but it may not even come to that this year. So I wanted to give you a little mix of what's taking place, and you'll probably hear some of these breakdowns coming out the rest of the week. But um, that's how the story is wrote, uh, will be written in this week. It can be very simple. You win, and you don't have to worry about all this stuff. Or it can get very intriguing and convoluted. With that being said, let's take our first break, come back to the other side. Might get a little thoughts from these guys over there. You saw him shaking the head just like mesmerized. Yes, I am the professor, the <laughs> dean of the swag. You know I'm coming in with a little mix for you, mixing the madness. We'll be right back at this first break. Come back on the other side. T. Madden and Associates is a sophisticated and experienced law firm located in your neighborhood. We're turning injury to cash. T. Madden and Associates obtained almost $2 million for my injury. They turned my injury to cash. Now, we can't guarantee how much your injury is worth, but we've recovered millions for our client. Call T. Madden & Associates at 833-PAID-123. That's 833-PAID-123. Q Time is our classic Atlanta soul food restaurant located in the historic West End. Q Time Soul Food is a family business started by Fred and Christine Crenshaw. Come on in, relax, and sink your chops into our tantalizing, mouth-watering, distinctive soul food with a twist, the Q Time way. 1120 Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard, or call your order in at 404-758-2881. Do you miss your mama's cooking? Then come on down to Q Time, an Urban Passport member. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lot. Dr. Camille's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson, Charles Bishop. Man, I love, I love the, the gurus, man. I love <laughs> Man, these I'm folks in the break, some of the, best, some of the best media talk is in And the honeymoon will be great. Yeah, yeah, finally you know, get married, you can't go on the honeymoon. Because <laughs> <laughs> everybody can really talk about how they see the world. And the true spirit comes out. You know, they refine those television. Everybody wants to be a little representative. They got reputation stuff. Oh, if you could only see them in the break, boy, I tell you, they would be ruined. <laughs> that being the case, we're going to go back to the CIAA championship. Um, they, people kind of open up with this, so we won't do a great deal of detail. Uh, but I'll at least give you the updates in terms of the score. That's number three, Fayetteville State Broncos, 9-2-7-0. Defeat Shawan Hawk, 7-4-7-0. That was a 31-28 final. As we talk about, you jump in there, it comes down to a field goal, 40-plus uh, yards. So big kick with no time. You're talking about a lot of pressure uh, to get it done, uh, to win it so you don't even have to worry about overtime and see what that looks like. Look like for a minute, maybe we get our first overtime uh, uh, in a while in terms of the CIAA. Uh, but no, Fayetteville says, no, nah, don't worry about that. We tired of this prize, man. Give me that dress. Give me that ring. We want it. Uh, and they got it done in terms of that matchup. So, Drew, uh, I know during the break, you there's no automatic bid for those people that may not realize that because they spend a lot more focus on the FCS level and the playoffs. You win your conference, you get automatic bid. That is not the case for the Division Two and CIAA is in the same region in terms of football with the SIC, also with the Gulf South Conference, and what is that, the – The uh, South Atlantic. South Atlantic Conference at the Division Two. 
So you've been focused on the D2 programs, but you don't know quite probably what's going on with those South. Um, Benedict, as they played well, um, we'll talk a little bit about where they finished, which will probably be number one ranking. This hasn't been released. This is just our best practices of what we've seen over the years and our thoughts on it. But there's a case that Fayetteville State may not get in, uh, even with a record of 9-2, and 7-0, and 0, uh, winning the CIAA because there's no automatic bid. Where were they seated coming into this, A.D.? They were outside of the top 10 coming in. Uh, they only released the top 10. Most pundits had Fayetteville State at 11. Here's the problem with Fayetteville State's resume. They are 2-2 two and two against teams above 500. Those two wins, Virginia State, Bowie State, those two Losses, Virginia Union and Wingate. Virginia Union and Wingate will both be playoff teams. Virginia Union. What are we, what are what are Virginia Union and Wingate last week? Where were they in the region? The, the, uh, four and five. Right, right. Virginia so, Union and uh, they Virginia made Union fall, is a CIAA representative. They may fall because they didn't play a game, but you couldn't imagine them falling probably past five and six yeah. if that. Yeah, I doubt if uh, Union Falls because Wingate's uh, opponent was a, I believe, a like a two or three win opponent in this final game. So that does not help their strength of schedule out. And Virginia Union, the despite a a strength of schedule not as good as Wingate's strength of schedule, there's enough of a margin there between these two teams, in the metrics of these two teams, where Union should still finish above Wingate for the number four seed and the ultimate play home playoff game, which is ultimately important for, for Union. Good stuff. Put a pin on it right there. B.J. Jones, Joshua Sims, I'm going to ask you to hold, and I'm going to get your thoughts after we go in to where um, the matchup we talked a little bit about Number one, Benedict Tigers improving 11 0 and 6 0, defeating number four, Tuskegee Golden Tigers, who are 8 3, 7 0, 58 21. Uh, obviously, that game was the SIEC championship game in Columbia, South Carolina. It's Benedict the way it goes in the SIEC. Uh, they alternate divisions, and fortunately for South Carolina, I mean, for in South Carolina, for Benedict, they got the host of the game because of their record. They really deserved it, but it played out that way. They got to play their home fans. They get it done in that matchup. Drew, going back to these playoffs, um, where was Benedict last week in terms of uh, the top ten in that region? Benedict was was number one. They they became number one after Delta State lost that previous week. Right now, Delta State, despite getting a win on yesterday, played a two win opponent in their final game of the season, which the projections have, that two-win opponent victory has allowed West Florida and Delta State to actually swap. West Florida was three, so now West Florida is projected to be the number two, and Delta State is projected to be the number three based on West Florida playing a 500 team in their last game of the season. So uh, one other thing, Fort Valley, SIC opponent, was number seven. They were idle. Fort Valley is in, in the same spot as Savannah State was last year, as Virginia State was back in, I believe that was 2017. Y'all may be able to help me out with that, uh, mm -hmm. with, with that year when they sat idle, sitting in that number seven spot. It's going to come down to Fort Valley, Limestone, Fayetteville State, and Newberry for spots six and seven. I think Newberry will get in, which means Fort Valley, Limestone, Fayetteville State. Fort Valley, Limestone has the better strength of schedule. Fort Valley has the better win percentage above with teams above 500. So it's going to, it's going to see how the committee really feels about that extra game Limestone played defeating Mars Hill, who was – no, excuse me, Dewberry defeated Mars Hill. That's why I think they'll finish sixth. Limestone defeated 
a sub five hundred team also on uh, yesterday. So it's really going to see depend on how the committee feels about how things played out and what Fort Valley's resume was going into that last week. Go back and read the article that I put out on uh, uh, D2Football.com if you want to uh, see what Fort Valley's resume is that they'll be considering today. So you got it broken down by D2 expert, particularly covers SIC. They did a great show for those who want to go back to it. You can check it out uh, this past week uh, on uh, Brian and AD. Uh, as they brought in the expert from CIAA as well. With that being said, I wanted to get you two gentlemen before we go to this next break. Uh, Joshua Sims, I'll start with you. Your general thoughts on that in terms of what you just heard uh, about the Division Two and how different it is from the FCS level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, this this is, um, you know, I, I played uh, FCS uh, in a time where, you know, we still – had an automatic qualifier in the MEAC where if you won the MEAC, you went to the playoffs. And and this was very interesting to find out well, what looked like a possible opportunity for four HBCUs to make it into the playoffs. Now you have a situation where an HBCU who's won their conference may not get in. You got an HBCU that was fairly, you know, really good team in Fort Valley State may not get in. Virginia Union who stumbled against the team who Fayetteville State beat yesterday will get in, and obviously Benedict, being as dominant as they are, will have the opportunity to be a number one seed. Haven't seen it since Winston-Salem State. So, and I remember that Winston-Salem State run because it was, you know, them making it to the national championship that year was like, it was it was everything here. Throughout yeah, the it, was gold. it was gold. It was gold. Yeah, we put robberies to the side, man, and everybody supported State in their, uh, in their pursuit to get that national championship. This is just... You know, for me, it's a lot to consume, Doc. I'm just trying to <laughs> find a way to digest all of this, man. This is interesting. But I do have a question for A.D. Drew. Quick. <laughs> well, let's, let's do the question on the other side. Okay. Let me get B.J. Jones' thoughts on this because we're up against this break. We'll come back and we'll be able to tease that out a little bit more so we can get full detail. B.J. Jones, what's your final thoughts on this in terms of this first half of the show segment? Doc, there's a lot. I feel like I've been sitting back. <laughs> Listening to Pythagorean theorem, and please excuse my dear Aunt Sally and all the formulas and metrics. And oh man, doc, it, it took me back to undergrad. Ooh, ooh. scary time. <laughs> um, man, but when you're just talking about man, it lets you know that what you do in September and October really matters in November, uh, no matter where you play. And a lot is to be said about who you play and who you beat, particularly when you're competing for playoff spots. Um, I I was hoping that Fort Valley went out to schedule a game uh for 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 this past weekend, you know, kind of strengthen their stance. Uh, but man, it it's going to be a very very interesting next few hours waiting on this Division Two selection show, uh, and, and see how everything pans out. I'm sure AD Drew Bryan will have updates in terms of the show today. The They'll be able to break all that down. We'll get it to you, but we wanted to tease you out. For our listeners, appreciate you coming in. We're up against it. We're going into the halftime, the marching sport, and everybody wants to see what's going on. We'll debut it on Thursday. Some big matchups took place this week. Uh, right there in Montgomery was a good one. Uh, so we'll talk about it. Obviously, down there in Mobile was another of the band matchups. So we'll talk a little bit more on that on Thursday. But we'll come back, and we'll get the question that Joshua Sims was going. We'll get Charles Bishop in the mix to talk about some of these matchups uh, in terms of the major division, had a lot of games there. So stick with us. We're just getting started. As we told you, we had the breakdown for the uh, Western division and how convoluted that got. So I know that took B.J. Jones to class uh, in that theoretical analysis as we talk about in sports uh, marketing and um, that, those things. I gave Charles Bishop that in terms of what he's looking at in his stats classes. So I'm sure he'll be able to. Uh, have some fun in terms of all this analysis. And then A.D. Drew comes in as the clinical professor and said, yeah, I'm ready to give you a headache as well. Take this. We'll be right <laughs> back after this as the professors are maddening and going to work. Stick with us. We got a whole nother half of the show. Let's get into it. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help 
to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk, chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. Some full, but we hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. Oh, we've got a good Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992. Or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Tell your mama hungry, papa hungry, brother hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Authentic Caribbean cuisine. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir, and pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. Dr. Ville's inside the HBCU Sports Lab. We have the full team, except for Mike Washington, he's traveling on business. Uh, I'm sure he'll sneak his head in here and he's gonna be mad because he can't give his data points. His data points, and he can't talk about Howard. That Howard, yeah, that <laughs> Howard. They got it done as well. Howard defeats South Carolina State Bulldogs as Howard improves to four six three and one. South Carolina State Bulldogs uh, fall to three and seven and one and three. Who would imagine coming in the season that you would see the Bulldogs falling this hard and it has trickled and fell fell apart twenty eight to fourteen. Uh, the Bulldogs scored late, literally, really late in that game to make it look uh, probably better than it was, uh, as it was 28 to 7 uh, in terms of that game matchup. Washington, D.C., a big time homecoming affair, all kinds of things was going on, and the Bison get it done. Joshua Sims Seniors, I think this is not your father's Bison. They're a little no. different. No, this is this is not my father's bison. This is not my grandfather's bison. Shoot, this is not my older brother's bison. This is a different <laughs> hour. <laughs> this is a different hour. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around uh, this version of how. But what, here's here's what I do want to focus on just quickly about this. South Carolina State's defense yesterday looked abysmal, and this is the first time I've seen that defense look this bad in a stretch of games. And I don't know how long, man. The last three games, their defense has been dominated, not only on the ground, but through the air as well. Howard yesterday found a way to run the ball all over them yesterday. And Jared Hunter yesterday scored twice on receiving touchdowns. Quinn Williams yesterday let he kind of lowered the, the, the turnovers and has been doing that for the last few weeks, by the way. But to see Howard this balanced, man, to see a Howard offense this balanced, you know, is, is very interesting. And they're young, man. They're bringing back a lot of guys next year. This is going to be very scary. Next year, we got to walk into Washington, D.C. Dog, I might have to I might have to jump on a Greyhound bus to go to that game. I ain't driving up there next year for that game, man. But <laughs> <laughs> salute to Howard, man. Mega bus, man. Howard. Mega bus. Yeah, the mega bus. Uh, salute to Howard, man, and the consistency they've shown. Obviously, uh, you know, minus that stumble last week against us, Howard's been very consistent. And South Carolina State has been very, very 
unlike themselves these last few weeks. Uh, I, I don't know where South Carolina State goes from here, Doc. Great points, great points. Let's go into another beatdown. This one was by the Panthers as they uh, righted the ship at least for a week. Number six, Caribbean and Panthers played like they were mad. Six and four, five and two. But everybody's beating up on the Golden Lions of Arkansas Pine Bluff to fall at two and eight on seven. Think about this. You know, uh, we were texting in the group and you had Prairie View Panthers hitting the panic button. As <laughs> Pine Bluff jumped up 10 to no, 10 to zero, I believe it was. And then the floodgates opened uh, and was not to be worried about. And I, I'm giving them updates on the Southern game. We'll probably tease that out a little bit as Southern got it done. Uh, for a minute there, you thought maybe Valley would make it interesting, and then Southern said, nope, nah, <laughs> nah stop it. <laughs> so, but we're talking about this Prairie View Pine Bluff game in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, Simmons Bank Stadium. What's your thoughts on this game, B.J. Jones? I mean, the biggest thing, man, Prairie View looks like the dominant Prairie View team that they've looked like um, at times during the season. Um, and, and the thing about Prairie View, you don't know which Prairie View team is going to show up. Um, you've seen them play uh, dominant football, and then you've seen them have these lapses, uh, which have cost them some ball games. Uh, but yesterday, it looks like it was going to be bad preview. They get it back in control, and, and they're dominant. Now you're one win away. Um, and you got to be feeling a lot better, you know, this week than you did last week because it's only one win. But you still got to go to Valley, and you got to play on that surface, uh, which is challenging to say the least. Yeah, great point. What's odd about this, uh, as we talked about Dooley and Southern being undefeated at home, this is a Prairie View team that seems to play better on the road. <laughs> Two of their losses are at home. Somebody make it make sense. Wow. That being said, they do beat Pine Bluff 55-24. So, yeah, why you talk about going to Valley is always disturbing. And Valley obviously got their home win a couple of weeks ago on a Thursday night. It might be one of those odd things where you like, no, you – Rather get Prairie View on the road because they seem to play better. Remember, this is the Prairie View team that lost the Valley. Where was it? <laughs> it was hey, in Prairie. Panther Stadium. Oh, how do you make it make sense? Let's get into the next matchup. We're going to bring Charles Bishop, my teammate here, as he was on the road yesterday, flew in, got it done. You know, planes do what they got to do. Uh, he doesn't have the jet yet. We're working on that uh, <laughs> in his for his next contract. We'll see. Yeah, I know, right? He, he got he got to do a little more. He got to hit a couple of those marks. We're right here. I know the pregame show has all this pizzazz and they're hitting all these markers on YouTube. Hey, man, we need a little bit of that over here. Put some work. I know. He was right. talking about the jet. That's a whole different question. Let me get back to you. Mobile Alabama Lab People Stadium, Gulf Coast Challenge, number one Jackson State just continues to roll. A little more challenging in terms of the score. A couple of things happening in this game. But there's one thing that we know is consistent, and that is the Jackson State defense. And, boy, did they show up in the second half when they were needed, and they said enough is enough. 10-0, 7-0 defeats Alabama a and Bulldogs that fall to 3-7, and 3-4. 27-13 was their score. Charles, what were your thoughts in this matchup as you were right there in the mix getting it done? Give us some insight. Yeah, I mean, when you take a look at this game, Doc, uh, uh, I think the team with the momentum was the team that had the wind at their back. It was cold and windy down there in Mobile uh, this past weekend. And But uh, <laughs> you take your hat off to Kyle Maynard uh, and, his, and his team. Uh, this was probably the best I've seen Alabama a and look uh, this past season. Um, uh, I, I think I looked at the stat. They had 50 attempts uh, rushing yesterday. Uh, they had a concerted effort to, to really try to run the ball and try to wear Jackson State's defense down. And to their credit, they had opportunities. Uh, they had opportunities, especially uh, when Shador went down and did not come back in the game. Uh, looking at him uh, after the game last night, he looked just fine. He was, uh, con you know, in congratulatory mood, uh, celebratory mood or, uh, with the rest of his teammates as they clinched Swag East last night. But uh, so he's doing well. We'll see, you know, uh, what it looks like for this upcoming week uh going against Alcorn, but uh, back to uh, Alabama and AM, they, they had some opportunities, I thought, uh, to really get in the game. And Jackson State's defense, they answered the challenge. Uh, they really did a good job of, of keeping uh, Quincy Casey in check with regards to passing the ball. Uh, but Xavier Langford, uh, I think he was a catalyst for Alabama and AM yesterday in terms of trying to get something going on the offensive side of the ball with a lot of quarterback runs. I think he had multiple attempts in terms of, of running. And Donovan Eagle, he was running really hard yesterday. Uh, it was a uh, really uh, challenging Jack State's uh, defense to really try to wrap up and get him down on the ground. But 
you know, and, and Dennis Thurman with trust, you know, uh, again, uh, Jackson State's defense, they might have bended a little bit yesterday, but they did not break. And in terms of breaking, I mean, uh, not giving up points on the scoreboard, 13 points again yesterday. I think a huge momentum play was right toward the end of the half. You know, Jackson State scored right before the end of the half, and that really yeah, kind of broke this game. That was crucial. It kind of broke this game up. I agree with you. That was a big play and not allowing a and uh, to get uh, the second score as they – uh, looked like they were going to get a break, and then they turned the ball over. And like you said, Jack State took full advantage, 40-yard plus touchdown uh, to put a little room in there and really was solid enough on the way out. And defense still does not give up a lot of points. Let's make yeah. sure we tell folks that. With yeah, that, let me big, go to 80. Let me go, let me go, to, go ahead, Charles, real quick. No, a quick bugaboo, I think, with Jack State over the past two weeks, uh, 13 penalties for a multiple – uh, yards uh, this past week, 11 penalties. Uh, they had a couple of touchdowns called back in this game. So that's something going forward that we're going to have to keep an eye on with regards to this Jackson State football team. Brad, you got that in there. Eddie Drew, quickly as we up against it, uh, want to give some uh, shout-out to the independent programs, and it is not the big blue of Tennessee State. They're falling on hard time. It's the team in North Carolina, the other team in North Carolina. I know uh, Josh Swims likes that way I put that. Number four, North Carolina A&T State Aggies go on the, uh, at home, get it done, 73-4-0. A little strange in terms of Charleston Southern Buccaneers, 2-8 and eight as they fall there, 2-3 and three in the conference. They win 20-10. They have to come from behind again. Uh, so maybe a little concern there, uh, but they get it done uh, in terms of that matchup. A.D. Drew, what are your thoughts in terms of A&T as they fight? Unlike the D2, they win the Big South. They get the automatic bid there in the playoffs. No, no, no nerve uh, people needed for this one. Look, <laughs> if you were late to this game, you didn't miss anything. If you had to leave early after this game, you didn't miss anything because all the bulk of the action happened in the second and third quarter where uh, the score was tied at seven and a, at halftime. Both teams scored a touchdown in the second quarter. Uh, A&T actually got their touchdown on the kickoff return, so they really didn't get anything going until the second half. Uh, Charles and Southern went up 10-7 before a t took control of the game, got the running game going, and also when you pulled away 20-10. to 10. So, yes, there will be two HBCUs in, in the uh, – excuse me, there will be an HBCU in the playoffs with a t making it, possibly to if Florida A&M does enough next week to impress the committee against a, uh, against a very substandard Bethune team. One quick question, Josh. Both take Oh, hold Central, on, hold Central. on. We, we, we up against oh. it. We got to get okay. questions. All right. We'll get into that last week and get these questions. But I do want to go to Josh Sims as he gets into the Norfolk, Virginia, Dick Price, Riddick Stadium. We got number three, North Carolina Central coming in the win. We talked about the fact they improved the 8 and 2, 4 and 1. More importantly, they win at least a share of the MEAC. We'll talk a little bit about that maybe in terms of the fact next week, Howard gets a chance to get a share of that. Uh, but more importantly, they have get to pack their bags and head to Atlanta for the Celebration Bowl as it was presented to them, the official announcement. They defeat Norfolk State Spartans 1-9, 1-3. and, nine, one and three. Uh, They dominate 44-14. Similar to what I talked about Prairie View and Pine Bluff, uh, Norfolk State jumped out of there, uh, and I was like, uh-oh. Uh, and then Norfolk said, I mean, in North Carolina Central Eagles, I should say, said, no, not so fast. Got it done. Joshua Sims, what are your thoughts in terms of this matchup? Yeah, man, quickly on, on this, Doc, <clears throat> Davius Richard with another five-touchdown day. Um, four through the air, one on the uh, on the ground. Uh, the kid passed for 347 yards yesterday. Uh, you know, and really, honestly, had we started in the first quarter uh, the way that we played throughout the remaining three quarters, it would have been worse than that. Uh, our defense really kind of hunkered down in that mm -hmm. second quarter, that third quarter, um, you know, and really, really kind of settled in and, and really played our, our brand of football. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, uh, there's some conversations that's going on inside of the program right now uh, because, you know, next week, obviously, we got Tennessee Tech. North Carolina Central has Tennessee Tech next week. Another opportunity to add another out-of-conference victory um, onto our resume. Uh, do we rest some of our key guys next week? Uh, or, do you know, are we going to be the team that decides the nod the way we start is the way that we finish? Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting. I will be at practice twice this week. Um, I'm actually going to Durham this week to see practice twice this week. Uh, but overall, man, just as an overall game yesterday, very, very proud of that offense, very, very proud of our defense hunkering down and, and finding a way to kind of close the game out yesterday. And uh, Davius Richard, man, for the Walter Payton Award. 
Yeah, he in it. It, it. Tell him when he gets in the red zone, it, he don't have to throw it all the time. We, we, we did it again yesterday. We did it again yesterday, Doc. <laughs> DJ Jones, get this last one. You were in the house and you talked about how electric it was. Uh, so big weekend for Alabama, man. They had the fun. Last week was Texas. This week was Alabama. Fam, you comes to town, Montgomery, Alabama State, ASU Stadium, Battle of the East. Who was going to show their spot to make sure they side up, locked up that second part as they start to see what's going on next? Obviously, we talked about Fam, you trying to make sure they put themselves in the best position as possible. FCS playoffs being Fam, you goes to eight and two, six and one defeat. Number five, Alabama State Hornets. Top five matchup that fall to six and four, four and three. Tight game went down to a last field goal, 21 14. And I'll talk, let you talk about how that went down uh, for the final score of 21 14. BJ Jones, what were your thoughts in terms of this match? Uh, it was a story of defense. Uh, defensively, Alabama State uh, was able to intercept Jeremy Musa multiple times to kill some family drives. There was a couple of family drives where they forced uh, field goals instead of uh, touchdowns, which came up being big. And then on the other side, man, Alabama State, how many times have we said this, Doc? Alabama State is a quarterback away. I understand that, that, you know, that Davis came in with a lot of hype, but a lot of this, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see it. That offense did not move until they went to Miles Crawley, and they went to Crawley a little bit too late, uh, mm. unfortunately. A lot of people around that ballgame were saying that Crawley probably shouldn't should have gotten the call at the beginning of the fourth quarter, uh, you know, at the start of the fourth quarter. But it look, came down to a field goal to score 15-14. Bama State had taken the lead with about uh, six minutes left. Fam, you retook the lead. And we're coming down. Crawley drives the Hornets down, gets them in field goal position. They get ready to kick uh, about a 49-yard field goal. It was going to be a long one. Uh, and it's blocked. The score is 15-14. Fam, you takes it all the way back to the house to make the score 21-14, man, and it was just pandemonium and, and the Rattlers that, that made the trip. And, and this is the thing, uh, a lot of things. There were a lot of Alabama 3A tags, which is Montgomery County, that had FAMU flags on them. Uh, what I learned yesterday is a lot of people that live in Montgomery that want to give get away from and go to an HBCU, a lot of those people go to FAMU. So there's a huge, huge FAMU alumni presence in Montgomery. Uh, like I said, this is this is, is going to bud into one of the biggest rivalries that we have in the conference. I love it. Great breakdown. Credit also to Alabama State defense. We talked about what Jackson State did yesterday uh, when the offense wasn't doing much uh, for whatever reason. Uh, just stifling, fam, you uh, getting all the time the whole second half. It seems like the play was played on. Uh, Alabama State side of the field, and they just come up with big plays. Interceptions here uh, just was stubborn, would not allow um, fam you to pull away with the game and gave themselves at least a chance late in the game. So great point when you talk about that matchup. Let's get back into the other side. We'll talk about some key matchups next week. We'll talk about that question. Jackson State as well, North Carolina Central, do you let players play? Uh, what is this going to look like coming back? We got some big matchups. Most of them are going to involve – the teams in the West. So we'll get back into that a little bit. Obviously, we got a big one with the independent North Carolina a &T. Uh, So let's take our last break, come back on the other side and talk about some of these big matchups going into week 12, what it's going to be. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers voice time and time again. Conversational powerhouse intelligent and sincere that's the voice you need for your creative marketing process k-e-a-v-e-r-s-v-o-i-c-e.com covers voice covers voice covers voice.com always on all the time from novice to aficionado find yourself here high quality cigars plus personal customer service slow burn is waco's only Mobile Cigar Lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to love you. And who the ball? Who the ball? 
So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, because he gonna teach a lesson. Yes. <laughs> This is Dr. Mill inside HBCU Sports Lab. Let's talk about some of these matchups last week. Let's talk about this one, uh, Joshua Sims. Howard and Morgan State, I think I know who you're rooting for because you don't want to share the championship. <laughs> but uh, it'll be fascinating if Morgan State can get this done. They literally will finish uh, second. They'll be tied for second at three and two. Uh, but they would have the head-to-head tiebreaker since you're going to use that for the First part, they would have the head head tiebreaker against Howard. So Morgan State, through all the thick and thin, they fall one game short of over 500, five and six if they can get it done. But think about that in terms of first year head coach in terms of Morgan play uh, that play. What are your thoughts about Morgan State Howard? Yeah, man, a uh, uh, supreme level of um, of kudos to Coach Damon Wilson putting them in this this situation in year one. And um, you know, obviously, yes, they'll fall a game short of under 500. Uh, but that is not a um, indictment on where he's taking that program in year one. Um, if they beat Howard, which I absolutely believe they're going to beat Howard because it's at Morgan State, um, mm-hmm. you know, those big DBs that Morgan State has is going to be interesting, man. So it's going to be a great opportunity for, uh, you know, for Howard to either, you know, continue to cement with the consistency that they've created or for Morgan State to say, hey, you know, we've been the second most consistent team in the MEAC you know, down the stretch. And so we should be definitely um, kind of rewarded with the second place finish inside the conference. And I don't think that that's a, that's a slight to War Morgan State to finish second in a in a brand new head coach's first season. So salute to Morgan State. I definitely have Morgan State in that game. I'm going to go to the big stop. This is where you talk about those playoffs. DJ Jones, uh, see your thoughts on North Carolina a and uh, They are 73 front for no in the big South. They will be on the road. In Ernest W. Spangler Stadium, Bowling Springs, North Carolina. I would ask Josh, where is that at? But we got time for that later. Going <laughs> away at 5 and 5, 4 and 0 oh, <laughs> in Big South. This is for a championship. BJ Jones, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of this matchup? I know you'll get to it on Top 5 Tuesday, but share a little bit. I mean, the biggest thing is, man, North Carolina and T, the, the biggest thing. Uh, in this turnaround is they look like North Carolina a and You saw them early trying to throw the ball a lot, uh, trying to throw the ball around. And it looks like someone in that offensive beat said, hey, man, we got these backs, one back in particular, um, and we have this offensive line, and we can move people. Let's do that. Um, and and sometimes, man, people try to get away from the formula that made them successful. But now I think you see in that staff honing back in and, 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 and to what they do, the, what their identity is. And it's going to be rough. For whatever reason, Gardner Webb gives A and T fits, and Gardner Webb is not like a hell of a program by any stretch of the of, of the means. But they give A and T fits. So it'll be interesting to see what A and T looks like going down there. Do they start slow? Do you get a game like Charleston Southern? Uh, but I like A and T to win it and uh, submit their spot in the FCS playoffs. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hey, Drew. <clears throat> hey, Drew. I'm going to take you to Camping World Stadium, Orlando, Florida. But Thorne Cookman comes in at two and eight, two and five. Fam, you is eight and two, six and one. We've seen this playoff over a couple of years, but fam, you got over the hump and said, no, not anymore. Tied. There another chance to make a statement for the playoffs, finish the season strong, and get a win over your rival. It can't get any better than that, period. What are your thoughts in terms of this matchup? I mean, on paper, Fab, you is going to be favored in this matchup, should win this matchup, and they will want to go out and win this matchup. Uh, impressively so that they can send that last statement to the committee, especially with uh, Bethune being a substandard opponent as far as their record is concerned. And that's what scares me about this matchup because it is a rival game and you're going to come out pressing, trying trying to do things maybe beyond your means. Uh, hopefully the experience that FAMU has had, Coach Willie Simmons has had in losing this game when FAMU has clearly walked in on paper with a better team, will be a factor, and he won't try to do more than he needs to do as far as getting it. If FAMU slows down, relaxes, and plays ball, and plays like they need to, and run the ball, because sometimes we get away from that. We try to pass the ball too much instead of running the ball. FAMU should win this game going away. But trying to throw the ball 50 times, but then we'll be able to stay in this game. 
Ooh, good points. Good points. Let me go back to you, Charles Bishop. Mm. For everybody else, you can go back to the first segment, and we broke down. It can be very simple for every wins. They're in the championship, and they will face Jackson State. Or it can get really good. Two-team tiebreakers, three-team tiebreakers. Hey, man, we got room for a four-team tiebreaker if that's the madness you're looking for, depending on what Prairie View and everybody else decides to do this weekend. I'm not talking to Prairie View. I'm asking you about Alcorn that could be in that mix against Jackson State. Jackson State 10 0, 7 0 against their rival on the road. Obviously, we talked a little bit about Shador. Um, which way do they go? Do you take the brakes off a little bit, make sure people are, are healed and ready for a championship game? Or do you chase this perfect season uh, to make the statement as you've already locked off that division against Alcorn, your rival 5 and 5, 4 and 3? Charles, what do you say? You don't have to tell us because we know you know the insights, but let me know your personal thoughts, not the coaching side of this. We'll give you time to show that on the pregame show. But what are your thoughts? Do you want the perfect season? You know, I think the conservative fan in me wants to rest some people. <laughs> but uh, the chasing history side of it wants everybody that's healthy. I want them out there. So, so that's an a, a interesting uh, way to look at it. But I, I think when you take a look at it all, Corn Jackson said, of course, you just throw out the records. I mean, it is going to be uh, a raucous crowd, maybe the most raucous crowd that we will see uh, this year, especially being on the road down there in Lorman, completely different environment. I expect to get a tremendous dosage of Jarvion Howard. He is a dude. I mean, he is going for a, a buck every week. Uh, you're going to get Nico Duffy. Uh, it's going to be an old-fashioned slobber knocker in between the tackles. I, I, I'm a, very much expecting that. So it's going to be a fun, raucous environment. Looking forward to it. But if you're healthy, I want you out there. Uh, I, I think uh, chasing history is, is something fun to do. It's fun to be a part of it. It's fun to uh, get everyone's best shot week in, week out, and still figure out ways to try to get the W. So I'm looking forward to it. I certainly can respect that. Similar question to you, Josh Sin Senior. You teased on a little bit. North Carolina Central on the road at Tennessee Tech. Central is eight and two overall, four and six non-conference game. Uh, they're going to the OVC. That's over there with Tennessee State play. I found a way to put the name in there, even though <laughs> record-wise, uh, nothing else needs to be said. But with that, uh, do you rest some people? You have a little more time to rest them if you like. And do you shoot to try to get the nine victories? Uh, Tennessee Tech make an, another statement for a non-conference win. Maybe it's a way to get in the top 25 FCS, obviously, sitting at uh, three in most people's poll, or at least the one that counts Dr. Deville. There's a chance now to push up to be number two with another strong victory. Josh Sims, what do you say? What do you do in this matchup? Uh, uh, Doc, I'm, um, you know, without telling so much, um, you know, Davius Richard, and before I tell you what my, my prognostication is there, is Davius Richard uh, yesterday became only the second quarterback in school history to pass for 2,000 plus yards in, in mm. three consecutive seasons. Um, he's now eclipsed over 6,400 passing yards in his career in North Carolina Central. He's got another year back next year with the expectation that he may become the all time leading passer in North Carolina Central school's history, um, passing the great uh, Air Harvey. Uh, with the opportunity to pass the great Air Harvey. He might have the opportunity next year. We'll see. We'll see. Air Harvey, obviously, is, is a dear friend of the family. Uh, and Air Harvey has done a great job of really promoting this kid, man, and promoting that this kid has the opportunity uh, for the first time in probably a long time, man. We've got a quarterback who's been a, a starter since he was a freshman and will be a starter all the way from his freshman year to his senior year with an opportunity yeah. to pass up Air Harvey. To that point, though, Doc, we need Davies as healthy as possible going into Atlanta. Without saying too much, this kid has played a very rough style of playing the quarterback position all season long. Everybody remembers what happened with Cam Newton, and he plays a very similar style to Cam. He, he idolized Cam. Cam last week when he came to homecoming, him and Davies had a chance to spend a lot of time together. Nice. Um, and so – as much as I would love for Davius to be able to go out and, and really kind of, you know, expand and, and, you know, really commit to really making uh, this game a little better, I believe our backup can get it done. I believe Walker uh, – I can't remember Walker's last name, but I think he can get it done, man. He's a, he's a gunslinger. He has the arm to be able to get it done. Our running game ain't going to go nowhere. 
as long as Mookie Collins is playing next week, our running game ain't going to go nowhere. Um, and I think that Walker can at least manage the game enough for us to be able to beat Tennessee Tech next week. But if if any of our coaches are watching right now, I'm begging and pleading to you without saying too much, please rest Davius Richard. All right? Oh, I yeah. love it. I love it. You're going to have a whole month to rest. Right. <laughs> I'm no, begging, the first half, at least. It's, it's, I'm it's begging and pleading. What you all don't understand on this show is we prep and they get like where I'm going generally in this show, literally the night before. So half the time they're half sleep because they're traveling, rolling, and doing their due duties with their own family, if not watching games so they can come on here and really give you some insight. But we don't get a chance to package this up as much as we would even like to. But I think it turns out the best. But this is perfect. You get Charles Bishop on his side. We want it all. We want to throttle people. We want undefeated. We want to stake our flag. Then you got another side that says, no, Joshua Sims says, no, we need to make sure we're healthy. We're going to go up against this juggernaut monster in his way. And you know, thinking about it, quote, unquote, I want to put words in people's mouth. He said, no, we want to be ready. We want to be at rep the me act. We, need, we want rest. So you get two sides of the issue. And this was not Doc, even and Doc, I'm not even mince. I'm not mincing words with Chuck. No, right you now. said it. I'm I not going to go back and forth with Chuck right now. I got one more <laughs> week of just being completely silent and just chilling, and now, then it's going to be on, I, Charles. I, I, I'm it's silent. Be too. on. I'm silent too because I got two more games. I got all corn and a swag child. The, the goal is still, still to get the swag championship. To, is to get to where you are. Congratulations, by the way. I have Thank to you, sir. I like that. I like Thank that. You, I would I would go to AD Drew, but we're up against it. But I already know AD Drew, as I'm gonna break down these last two matchups, I know what you want. You want chaos. So I'm not even gonna add you. You want total chaos. You love to be the well, you know, the progenitor of chaos, man. So you want chaos. With that being said, you got Texas Southern going to Alabama AM. Texas Southern gets the chance to have their first winning season in forever. So not only they're still Huge. taking the opportunity, as you saw Huge. the breakdown in the first quarter, literally a chance to play for a championship, and coaches speaking towards that. Uh, but I think just as important the fact they got a chance on a winning season, but they got to go on the road. They got to go to the Alabama a and team that obviously certainly has not quit. So it'll be a tough one, but if they get a chance to earn that, that's five and five, four and three, sweat, three and seven, three and four, Alabama a and In terms of that matchup, it's going to be fascinating to see Body seems to come in his own. They really beat up Grambling in that game in every facet, defense, special teams, offense, as they got rolling. So you're talking about perfect timing in terms of playing in it. So I'm interested in that matchup. One o'clock, Lose Cruz Stadium, Huntsville, Alabama. The game will not be shown on any of the networks in terms of ESPN, HBCU Go, but they'll have their own feed, so I'll be checking that out. Then the other one is Prairie View going to Mississippi Valley State Rocks. Rice Totten Stadium. It also would not be on one of those networks I talked about, so you'll have to get the feed uh, from Mississippi Valley. But Prairie View, 6-4, and 5-2, and two, they get a chance to quiet the noise, go in there and get the win, or Valley can get their second win and total chaos that A.D. Drew loves will take place, and then we'll get a chance next week to talk a little bit about Bayou Classic and how much Let's it will be even more else. important. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in terms of B.J. Jones' world. So it's going to be fascinating this last weekend. Yeah, it's coming down the stretch, but it's still finding a way to interesting. Whether it's the D2 playoffs, check out A.D. Drew, Brian, this evening, uh, as I'll be listening in to see what goes on there as I take check out the Division Two announcement this afternoon. Uh, but that'll do it for us. We gave you a little extended time. As you saw this weekend, a lot of teams going into uh, the extra – Overtime, things of that nature, I'm rooting for everybody, everything, HBCU, every HBCU. Perfect shirt to talk about it. Check out BJ Jones on Top to, top 5 Tuesday uh, in terms of his Twitter spaces as they get it going. And then on Wednesday, you got Joshua Sims Sr. on Wednesday as you get in HBCU Nightly. I'll be back in the mix this week as I was traveling. Las Vegas, uh, Lion Brother took care of me caught up with some other brothers and I did my thing in terms of the Dion Fett presentation about how to make it through the academy. So, you know, I got to take care of my academic end. Y'all would appreciate that because I got it done. Make sure you check out the pregame show because they're going to give you some insight. 
Obviously, people got questions on Shadow Sanders. I gave you a breakdown. Charles touched on a little bit. You'll get more information. Stick with them. They'll lead you right through it in terms of what that looks like. They still playing for a lot. I told you all four is in the mix. They need it uh, in terms of if they can get a little chaos uh, with Prairie View. Obviously, the following week, as we said, we get into those Thanksgiving weekend uh, games, uh, playoffs, all those kind of things. That'll do it for us today. Uh, thank you for listening to Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Thanks all the lab listeners out there. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Yadikaville, the Dean of HBCU Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBCU Sports with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, and the, go- the guys uh, in the profession with A.D. Drew, Joshua Sims Sr., B.J. Jones, making sure you get your Sunday wrap down the mix in terms of what took place. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watts, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6, and then on Sunday, as you know, we'll give you more wrap-up. Look forward to the latest in the news. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. That's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Inside the HBC Sports Lab, one on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles. Of course. A.D. Drew. Fletcher. Joshua Sims. B.J. Jones. Roy. This is this.